Welcome to the Jason Podcast. I'm Josie Briggs, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology. Each month in this podcast, we talk about a paper in the current issue uh, with the hope that this will prompt you, our listeners, to go to our website and turn to the latest issue. The paper we're talking about today is an important one. I believe it's entitled Structural Racism, Historical Redlining, and Incidents of Kidney Failure in U.S. Cities, 2012 to 2019. Here to help us unpack this important study are two of the authors. The first author is Kevin Wynn. Dr. Wynn is Assistant Professor in the Department of Health Law, Policy and Management at BU School of Public Health. Kevin, welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And also with us today is Deidre Cruz, who is also a co-author on this study. Dr. Cruz is Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, and as some of our listeners know, President-Elect of the American Society of Nephrology. So, uh, both of you, uh, but Deidre, congratulations on this important role in our society, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Okay, first question, Kevin. Let's start with reminding our listeners about the history of redlining. Can I ask you to give uh, our listeners a short history lesson about the practices of the homeowner Sloanus Corporation uh, and their persistence? Sure. Uh, so historical redlining is considered a key example of structural racism, which has been defined as the totality of ways that societies foster and embed racial discrimination. So in, 19, in the 1930s, following the Great Depression, uh, the federal government established the Home Owners Loan Corporation, and uh, they were tasked with grading the risk of mortgage lending. And so specifically what this meant was that um, the local real estate professionals evaluated neighborhoods and each neighbor, or these neighborhoods were assigned one of four color-coded grades. A grade of A, which was green, meant best. Uh, B, which was blue, meant still desirable. C, which was yellow, meant declining. And D, which was red, meant uh, hazardous, thus the term redlining. And so if a neighborhood was redlined, it was considered unsuitable for mortgage lending. And this meant that individuals living in redlined neighborhoods could be denied access to credit by lenders, thereby shaping access to wealth building opportunities and other resources. And residents of these neighborhoods were disproportionately black people, people with low incomes, religious minorities, and immigrants. Um, so to your question about persistence, um, there is evidence that suggests that present day neighborhood conditions are linked to historical redlining. Uh, in part because of persistent and systematic disinvestment of these neighborhoods. And by that, I mean that racial, uh, racialized residential segregation today has persisted in many neighborhoods that were redlined. And race played a big role in how those original lines were drawn. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so you took to look at the long-term effects on kidney health of this district district divisions. How'd you actually do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, the overarching goal of our study was to assess the relationship between residents in a historically red line neighborhood and contemporary instance of kidney failure. Uh, and so previous studies indicate that residents in historically red line neighborhood is associated with other adverse health offense, uh, outcomes, excuse me, uh, such as late stage cancer diagnoses or diabetes related mortality, but uh, fewer to our knowledge had focused on kidney disease. And because as many listeners know, uh, neighborhood conditions are a huge contributor to inequities in kidney disease, and we thought this was an important gap. Uh, just briefly, there may be some people wondering about the potential pathways driving this relationship. Uh, so broadly, through systematic disinvestment in these neighborhoods that were redlined, this policy could create conditions in present-day neighborhoods that uh, could lead to inequitable rates of kidney failure incidents, uh, including inequitable wealth, 
exposure to pollution, higher rates of food insecurity, or worse access to healthcare. Uh, in terms of how did we do this or and what data did we use, um, we were fortunate in that these historical maps for hundreds of metropolitan areas had been digitized by teams at four universities as part of a collaborative project called Mapping Inequality. We used data from the Renal Management Information System Medical Evidence Report from 2012 to 2019. Uh, and this form is required by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to be completed for all people initiating treatment for incident kidney failure. And importantly, it includes a patient's primary mailing address. So we use this information to geocode patients into neighborhoods, which we then linked to these digitized maps. Yeah, it's a big undertaking uh, and an important one. So what are your most, give our listeners just a quick rundown on the most important findings. Absolutely. So our most important finding was that residents in a historically red line neighborhood was associated with significantly higher rates of kidney failure incidents between 2012 and 2019. Um, so compared with neighborhoods that were historically rated A or best, Neighborhoods with all other grades had significantly higher rates of kidney failure incidents, with the disparity widening with each grade. So that would mean that the highest rates were among neighborhoods that were historically redlined. And this relationship was observed for nearly all of our subgroup analyses, which were stratified by age, sex, race and ethnicity, and primary cause of kidney failure. Um, importantly, I do want to note that the incidence rates were highest among Black adults in our sample when compared to the national average of all adults in our sample, irrespective of neighborhood grade. Yeah, that's an important finding, that, that the, the black-white uh, disparities are more pronounced even in, in these historically redlined communities. These are very persistent effects. We could spend a long time discussing all the factors that may contribute to the association of where you live with the development of disease. Uh, your discussion of this in, that paper, in your paper is excellent. We also have a terrific editorial by Rudy Rodriguez, uh, and I urge our listeners to look both. Uh, one of the things that came up as we discussed this was, was gentrification uh, and uh, whether and why these effects are so persistent in spite of the fact that at least some of these neighborhoods uh, have much less economic disparities. What, what are your thoughts on persistence of these effects? Yeah, I totally agree. I'm sure we could chat about this topic for multiple episodes. Uh, but And I also want to note that I really appreciated Dr. Rodriguez's thoughtful editorial. Um, your question is great, and I think you're right that um, there are neighborhoods in many metropolitan areas that have had different patterns of gentrification or redistricting or displacement. So building upon your point, I think that understanding the impacts of gentrification on kidney health is a really important extension of this work that warrants attention. And thinking about it both among adults or, excuse me, individuals who stay in gentrified neighborhoods and those who are displaced because of gentrification. Yeah, good point. It, it, it affects both the people there and the people who are forced to move out. Uh, but keep going. Um. Thank you. Um, additionally, there's evidence that present day neighborhood conditions in many metropolitan areas have been linked to historical redlining. And so I think our study, which focuses on individuals with incident kidney failure in you know, 141 metropolitan areas, illustrates the persistence and legacy of historical racist policies on contemporary inequities in kidney health. Let me turn to you, Deidre. Uh, I, I know you've thought about this topic a long time, for a long time, uh, and have had many insights into these persistent problems. You and I talked about this general theme uh, three or four years ago when I first became editor. Uh, what are important takeaways uh, that you want to remind our listeners uh, from this uh, study? Thank you, Josie. Um, you know, I think um, there are a number of things that, that uh, this study that I was really honored to have an opportunity to, to, to collaborate with, with Kevin and others on. Um, I think there are a number of things that we should really think about here. I think one of them that Kevin underscored a moment ago was that um, really this this um, this issue, this this 
very uh, discriminatory practice of redlining um, really ended up, as we we're, we show in this in this study, ended up actually having negative effects on everyone, not just the uh, racial or ethnic minoritized communities that I think uh, many of us, uh, certainly when we look at the historical accounts of that practice, would say that we would have expected to those groups to have had the uh, greatest impact um, on on sort of living in these types of environments and I think finding that uh, that 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 gradient in terms of the um, the uh, homeowners um, association sort of gradient seem to be there uh, for really all groups not not just black individuals for, for example and so um, I think that's one important point but as we we think about what this means for those of us in the kidney community, either as, as working as clinicians or conducting research in this space, I think uh, there are a few things that that are worth um, considering. I think one of them is 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 we have a, in my view, a great need to um, to be more cognizant and to recognize uh, the impacts that that these sorts of practices um, have on people in in in, in present day. So the, the people that we may be treating as patients. Um, certainly, even even our colleagues uh, who who may um, have have uh, uh, you know lived in these in these sorts of communities when they were when they were growing up, um, I think considering how that shapes the context in which people are living, I think is, is an important one. Particularly when I, when I think about things like when we're counseling patients about uh, lifestyle modifications or things that we wish that they could do for for themselves uh, regarding uh, their kidney health considering the um, environment that they that they may be living in due to factors such as redlining, um, I think it is really important. Um, but I also think that for those of us that are conducting research uh, and have that as an important part of our of our of our um, work, that we need much more work to understand both the impacts of these types of discriminatory practices, as well as ways to mitigate them. So interventions that can be that can be done to actually mitigate the effects of, of these uh, discriminatory practices, I think are going to be important. And of course, as always, we need to continue our advocacy efforts around um, uh, shaping policies, both in our local context, but also uh, nationally, uh, that might actually um, serve again to mitigate some of these effects that these these types of policies have had on on uh, the um, the populations that we are focused on, of course, uh, those who are uh, living with kidney diseases. Yeah, I, I I like that emphasis that we need to think about what we can do uh, as citizens. Uh, and one of the points that Dr. Rodriguez makes is that there are maps where you can look at your own neighborhood and better understand the area right around you and and what the history is of, of these neighborhoods. Uh, I think many of us have come to feel that it uh, makes for a better life to live in a more diverse and integrated communities, but, but unfortunately much of our uh, public structures actually make those communities uh, sparse and hard to find. Um, and and I, one of the reasons I felt that it was important to highlight this paper is that we are all citizens and, and we need to, to think not only of things that impact our, our, our professional lives, but, but as uh, physicians have a particular voice in the public sphere and, and we do need to remind people that that uh, some of our inner city communities are really very unhealthy places and, and more diversified communities will, will be good for all of us. Um, this is such important work and I really want to congratulate uh, Kevin Yu as the first author on the study and, and Deidre for your long historical articulation of the complexities of this, this kind of topic. Uh, Jason is very proud to be publishing it. it it'll be uh, illustration will be on our cover, and, and I really do hope this short podcast encourages people to to look at this uh, really impactful paper, and to look at uh, the excellent discussion of the many factors that contribute to these problems. So thank you both for joining us, and thank you to our listeners. Um, I, I hope you find this uh, constructive and informative work. Thank you. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. 
all rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare professional if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast from the American Society of Nephrology.